Ladies and gentlemen, the panel is going to start in a few minutes. I'm not the moderator. I am not the panel. My name is Patrick Chapat. I am an editorial cartoonist for the New York Times and for European media, Le Temps and NZZ Amzantang. And we thought it would be interesting to introduce the topic tonight as a warm up by showing a few cartoons. What do you think? OK, so listen, it's really good to be having this uh, conversation about the people left behind here at the World Economic Forum, because that was, is the right place to be talking about income inequalities. <laughs> it is. An American carnage happened in 2008. You know what I'm talking about, right? the subprime implosion, the financial crisis. And uh, that caused a lot of pain, a lot of destruction. Let us remember who saved the day back then. Who came to the rescue of big banks? Well, the little taxpayer did. <laughs> so soon uh, the financial economy was back on track. The stock market recovered. Uh, for the real economy, it took more time, you can, you can look at that uh, differently as seen from the little guy. <laughs> so on the ruins of the old economy, a new one is emerging, of course, driven by technology and digital giants like Amazon, which started by turning upside down the book industry. They're, not coming, they're now coming to a brick and mortar place next to you. You know, in this economic transformation, jobs were lost. Uh, people seemed to lose hope in the future. They started to wonder, is upwards mobility still working in America? <laughs> so at that point came a political revolution. A populist was elected to the White House, the stablest of all geniuses. He appealed to the forgotten men and women of the United States. He said he would bring back coal jobs. His promise was America first. Well, he didn't specify first in what. <laughs> Donald Trump said the problem is immigration and Muslims and uh, people coming from, you know, shithole countries, excuse his French. Uh, he says he wants a new immigration. He wants prime quality migrants. <laughs> but hey, Trump had a huge success, the tax cut. Okay, it's a, a tax cut that mostly favors the richest Americans, but that's fair. Why would you pay for roads and bridges when you hardly use them? So ladies and gentlemen, here we are at the start of a new year, the start of a new era that will be profitable, hopefully, at least for the 1%. As for the others, the left behind, they are left wondering, will trickle-down economics work? And that is my question for the panel. And I now leave the stage to Donna of uh, USA Today. Thank you. All right, how can we top that? That was fantastic. Thank you, Patrick. So um, we've got a pretty serious uh, topic to discuss after that. Uh, we're going to be talking about left behind in the United States. Uh, but before we get started on our, our panel, uh, I wanted to show you a little video. Um, last year, after the very hard-fought presidential election, the country was feeling terribly divided. And USA Today embarked on a project to introduce our readers to extraordinary Americans. Um, these were Americans who sought to make a difference in their communities. Big ways, little ways. 
Um, they were of every race, every religion, every political pers persuasion. They were from red states and blue states. Um, and we didn't ask them. We didn't ask them what their politics are. So um, we, just, we just wanted to present them to our readers. And the uh, project was called I Am an American. So a few weeks ago, when I found out I was doing this panel, uh, we went back to some of those people who we had written about. And we asked them what they felt about the state of the United States a year later. And so here is what they had to say. Five words when I think about America today. Broken. Dialogue. Uncertain. Powerful. And challenged. I think for America, we're heading for a crisis. There's a philosophy right now in our country that we should be more local, more America first. We need to get back to the reality that we're part of a global reality, a global community. I think fear separates us from one another. I think the idea that those who aren't like us are out to get us, I think that's a very dangerous idea. I think we're scared of things that we don't know, things that are new, and that we are exacerbating situations by focusing on all the differences and everything that divides us. In my lifetime, I don't remember America ever being as divided as it is now. The lines of communication are going to have to open up because if we continue down this path, you know, I, don't, I don't see anything necessarily good being accomplished. Some of the issues that lay up on the surface are easy to diagnose. They're like political, religious, how we feel about gender issues. Um, but I think it's a lot easier to hate than the love. And um, it takes a long time to just go in and learn someone's story rather than just hating them for one of their ideologies. I think that we really need to look at the political party system in this country and really decide whether it is actually meeting the needs of our democracy. I think the majority of Americans want to be a part of the world and they want the world to be, be a part of them. What worries me about the future of our country is that we're not learning from our mistakes. We've seen things that have divided us and we're not doing anything to work towards change. Whatever your desires are, whatever your wishes and dreams are for you and your family, it's the same for immigrant and refugees. It's the same. We all have the same dreams and the same goals. And then you think, well, how am I gonna get there? You really just have to sit down and see the humanness of your neighbor, you know? That your neighbor is more than what he or she thinks about gender fluidity, um, religion or political stances. A lot of the times I just don't see people really wanting to put in that hard work. This kind of tunnel vision thinking, um, this ideological approach to reality. Reality is always more complex. Reality is always messy. <laughs> and you can't control life. I mean, you, you, you can try to understand life and try to help other people, but it, it, it's a journey. Americans need compromise. They need someone to stand up and say, although I may take the political hit for this, I am going to stand up for what is right. I think we need another person of quality, like George Washington, to actually say no to power, to actually put that power back in the hands of the people. After all, the Constitution starts with we the people. It doesn't say we the CEOs or we the elected representatives. It's we the people. It's all of us. OK, so we'll get this discussion started. Let me welcome up our panelists. Okay, everybody's here, settled in, excellent. All right, so um, during our session today, it's called Left Behind in the United States, we're gonna take a look at the issues that seem to be fueling that deep divide and the sense of dissatisfaction in the United States. There are actually some troubling indicators 
Um, life expectancy in the US is down for the second year in a row. And those declines are actually quite out of sync with the rest of um, developing, the rest of developed nations and even some developing nations um, where you know, lives are actually getting longer and healthier. And um, also, the, even, you know, we have a growing economy right now, but wages are, are by and large stagnant. And that is the sort of thing that really sort of cuts at the middle class. You heard some of their voices today, and now we're going to try and drill into why it is that uh, folks feel left behind, disenfranchised, and sort of not part of the American dream. And so I'm going to start by introducing Arlie Russell Hochschild. She spent five years at the kitchen tables and the crawfish boils of the people of southwest Louisiana, researching for her book, Strangers in Their Own Land, Anger, Mourning on the American, Anger and Mourning on the American Right. And she is a professor of sociology at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, next, we have Congressman Mark Meadows of North Carolina. He is chairman of the House Freedom Caucus. It's a group of roughly 40 conservative members of Congress. And he is in the, the group, and he is are dedicated to giving voice to those who feel forgotten by their government. And next, we have uh, Mary Kay Henry. In 2010, she became the first woman elected international president of the Service Employees International Union. You probably know that as the SEIU. She has 30 years of experience organizing healthcare workers to fight for a higher minimum wage, affordable health care, and in general, improving the lot of working families. Uh, next, we have Mike McGavick. He is the CEO of XL Group, which is a global insurance group. Uh, he's been active in Republican politics and was a, a key strategist in an effort to change US Superfund's environmental laws. And finally, we have Dr. David Scorton. He is the 13th secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. You might know him for the Museum of Air and Space. But he oversees 19 museums and galleries, 20 libraries, I think, the National Zoo, uh, research by the Smithsonian. Um, and what's very interesting is his strategic plan for the Smithsonian, which calls for a focus on convening critical conversations about topics of public interest. So now I'm going to ask you all a question. So how many people here think that in the future, for the next generations, uh, life for Americans will be better? Please raise your hands. OK. Five. OK. And how many think it will, the future for the next generation will be worse? OK. I'd like to see that optimism. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Well, so the Pew Charitable Trust, Pew Surveys, did a survey in July. And they asked that question of Americans from both parties. Uh, more people say, for, uh, say the future for the next generation will be worse. 48%, but they are actually more optimistic than you are. So, <laughs> all right. On that note, we will, <laughs> we're, let's go to Arlie. So your book, you spent five years researching this. Tell us why you embarked on this journey and what you found. Already in 2011, I could feel the split of going. Congress was at a standstill. And I realized that I was in a bubble in Berkeley, California. And, um, and that it, it was a geographic bubble. It was a media bubble. I read the New York Times. It was a electronic bubble. You know, I'd opened my laptop, and it gave me back to myself. Then I realized that we're all in bubbles. And if I was going to really understand what was going on, I had to get out of my bubble and find an equal and opposite bubble that's as far right as Berkeley, California was left. Take my moral and political alarm system off uh, and permit myself a great deal of interest and curiosity to get to know the people um, close up that I thought I'd probably have differences with. 
And it's the most extraordinary experience of, of my academic life. It was amazing. They were uh, wonderful people who seemed to live in a different truth in certain ways. I went in with the red state paradox question. How could it be that across the nation, it's the poorest states, the states with the worst health care, the worst Muse fewest museums or you know, lowest wages, um, lowest life expectancy, most pollution, are also the states that receive more money from the federal government uh, in aid than they give to it in taxes, and also fear and revile the federal government. That, that, if, if you have a problem, when you want some help. Louisiana, where I ended up, um, in uh, around Lake Charles mainly, uh, turned out to be an exaggerated version of that. Uh, second poorest state, 44% of the state budget came from uh, federal government and overwhelmingly Republican Tea Party. I was interested in the people who were most enthusiastic. I was interested in people like you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and trying to get you yeah, yeah. <laughs> real life <laughs> And so th when I got there and went fishing, I'd ask people, could you show me where you were born? Where did you go to school? What, what row did you sit in? You know what church? Do, could we go to the church? Uh, where are your parents buried? And the course of things, and, and going fishing, especially fishing, that was the best. You're, this, you're in this boat, you know. <laughs> and um, uh, they threw that question away. They, they, like one guy that begins the book, his name is Mike, and he's born at Sugar Plantation as a child and works in oil all his adulthood, sort of the old south, the new south, and uh, loved the Tea Party. Real, he's your guy. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and I said, great, thank you so much for, for letting me get to know you. you know, I'm writing a book on this, is it okay? I'll tell you, I, I, and I'm completely open. Look, I'm a professor of sociology, you know, uh, scar number one, <laughs> um, uh, Berkeley, California, so blue, blue, blue. And we had some wonderful conversations. And actually, quite a lot of common ground came out. But about my question, he threw it away. He said, you know what? We're ashamed of being the second poorest. We don't want to be the poorest. You know, uh, those bad rates, yeah, yeah. And as Cajuns, they almost made fun of themselves, very self-deprecatory sense of humor uh, about it. But he said, that's. It's your question, it's not mine. We don't want to be reliant on the federal government or the state government. Um, and they had, I don't know if you want my whole rap of the book, but well, that there was a deep story underlying his, his political beliefs. And I think left and right, all, both of us, you know, have a deep story. And the book is about that uh -huh. deep story. So what would you say is, um, Congressman, is the fundamental um, thing that, that folks in the, in the Tea Party reach for uh, politically? What do they want? What do they feel about their state of life? You know, I don't know if it's much, as much the Tea Party as is it, is it is uh, people in general. I mean, it, with you going down to Louisiana to talk to people, I mean, generally speaking, I serve uh, the mountainous area of North Carolina, and uh, there is a distrust of the government. In fact, uh, there's a distrust of engaging globally. The very fact that I'm here does not get me points. And, uh, you know, and so when you look back, you have to realize, well, no, it, you know, I think uh, the, the interesting thing, I, I look out, I've got a colleague, a Democrat colleague that uh, is on the front row. We have a lot more in common than the R or D would suggest. And, and what happens is, is, is uh, you know, his wife has actually reached out to my wife and they've been, I mean, truly could not have been more gracious. Uh, and sometimes we want to put people in a box, in a Tea Party box or a liberal box or this box. And really everybody just wants to live the American dream if you're from America or you want, you want to have your kids uh, you know, you go to work not because necessarily that it's gratifying for you, that is one part of it, but really to provide for your children or your grandchildren so that they have a better way of life. Now, what happens is, is that comes into conflict 
uh, you know, many times in, in areas outside of the urban areas, it comes into conflict with they, they distrust the government. They distrust party politics, uh, a lot of them. Uh, and so they're looking for someone to help uh, make sure that they can rise out of poverty. And, and a lot of times it is, um, it's very difficult. You know, so you, you have these labels. Uh, we started a caucus that, you know, we said we're for the millions of Americans who felt like Washington, D.C. had forgotten them. Now, we didn't have a party associated with that. In fact, if anything, uh, you know, my party many times wishes we would go away. And, uh, and so when you, when you look at that, it's, it's all about trying to make sure somebody has a voice. I, I probably have, you know, we've got somebody here with, with the union. I probably have more union support that would be typically a Democrat voter who said, all right, this guy is, is willing to hear what concerns me, the fact that I'm more concerned about what happens with my family than anything else. And so you take uh, a typical Democrat voter who says, listen, I don't care about parties. And, and I think, that, honestly, that's what Donald Trump tapped into. He, he felt like uh, wages were stagnant. So you got union workers voting for him. Perhaps the first time I had people coming up and saying, I've never voted for a Republican ever. And this billionaire is going to represent me, even though uh, there's a huge disparity. So uh, I, I think it's living the American dream. I, I've been blessed enough to do that. I mean, my wife and I started a small business with a $25,000 credit line. Uh, we came from nothing uh, in very humble beginnings. And, uh, you know, and I've been in the Oval Office more in the last you know, year than... I ever imagined I would be, you know, so, um, but it's, it's about meeting that fundamental need. So whether it's in the United States or in Switzerland or in Africa or anywhere else, everybody wants to, to make sure that they can provide for their family. So let me turn to you, Mary Kay. So you do represent uh, the unions. Where do you think they started to feel the disconnect or if, if they felt a disconnect at all with the government? I think of myself as representing home care providers and child care providers and registered nurses and corrections officers, uh, two million people working hard every day who think they're left behind because the basic promise of America where when you work hard, uh, you ought to be able to get ahead and your children ought to be doing better than you've done has been broken. And it seems like the audience in general feels with that. And I think for our members and for the 64 million people that are living in our country and working two and three jobs and can't find their way out of poverty like Mark did, um, I think they feel like the system's rigged against them on many levels. Uh, for African Americans in our country, the system's been rigged since slavery and we haven't unrigged the rules. Uh, for immigrants in our country, the system's rigged because we can't uh, figure out a public policy that gives a path to citizenship. And for all working people, um, CEOs and corporations are incentivized uh, to not put money back into the pockets of workers uh, so that wages are rising as our productivity rises. And so um, I think why we think it's really important for working people to be able to join together is it's a way for working people to join with government and with business leaders to rewrite the rules in a way that will allow us all to do better. And I believe, I'm optimistic, in spite of thinking that there is no, um, the, my members generally feel their future is not gonna be better, I'm optimistic that together in our incredible country that our government can come together if working people have a larger organization and say uh, in being able to raise wages and uh, allow our democracy to include everybody. So Mike, let me tap, tap your expertise as a, as a CEO, as an employer of workers. Do you feel like uh, corporate America has disconnected with the American middle class? You know, it, it's an interesting challenge to think about America whether, where we worked a little harder not to label each other and worked a little harder to solve problems. So I look at what's going on and this demonization of corporate America. And I find it very much at odds with the people I work with, with the peers I deal with, and the company I lead. 
we fundamentally exist, particularly in the company I lead, uh, for a very important social purpose, to try and make the ill things that befall people corrected, and to do that in a way that can be done rapidly and fairly. That's a pretty useful thing to be doing. And when I hear broad swaths of American and Americans set aside because they're this or that, usually because they're different than the particular niche I occupy, I tend to shut down a little bit and say, Let, let's really work on what's going on. Mm -hmm. Ironically, as I listen to this conversation, I would have been one of those hands up at the first side of it. I am more optimistic. Um, that's because I believe fundamentally that these questions are a trailing indicator of people's experience. What they have been experiencing still is the slowest recovery from an economic dislocation in American history. And they are deeply embittered by that. Because when that happens over a long period of time, you will lose your faith in upward mobility. Because it isn't happening around you. And in fact, what is happening around you is despair. Why is, uh, why is lifespan declining in America? Opioids is the simplest answer of all. And why is it so prevalent? Despair. So I think about what is the conversation we should be having that would unlock growth, unlock despair, because fracturing is a function of anger and jealousy that happens when opportunity is denied. You create opportunity again, which I actually believe is starting to happen. And I believe what comes from that will be a coming together and a focus on how to accelerate that progress. That's the conversation I'm here to engage in. And I believe it's at hand. So one of the things, um, uh, David, that is, I think very much tied to opportunity is education. We, we're here talking about you know, Industry 4.0, a lot of technology displacing manufacturing jo jobs, which were very key part of the middle class experience in the United States. Where do you think um, we are failing in our educational system to provide people with opportunity? And where are we succeeding? So there's a lot of wisdom on the panel, and I want to thank you for making me a part of it. Um, I have to admit that I started out life, I'm going to burden you with a little personal information. Uh, my dad uh, and his family came over from Russia 100 years ago next year. And uh, I was in that group of people who were very optimistic about the United States because my dad said, don't tell me about your troubles. We have things that we can do in this country. My dad barely finished high school, and one generation later, me, his son was able to go to college and medical school and do all these unbelievable things that, uh, that Grace has allowed me to do. But I have to admit, I vote with a 48% unless we make a few changes. And education, I think, could be one of them. I want to point out one thing that I know USA Today is well aware of because I've seen the coverage before. This is not the first time that people have been pessimistic. In polling data several times over the last 30 years or so, there have been dips in optimism like this. But I honestly think there's a couple things a little bit different about this. I spent some of my research career working on ways to take medical images and automatically analyze them so that you could have a machine assess how narrow your coronary artery was rather than have a cardiologist estimate by eyeball. And we had some success with it. I never thought that a few years later I'd be sitting here at Davos reminding everybody that we have 1.8 million truck drivers in the United States. 1.8 million truck drivers. Why do we have so many? That's one of the last occupations where you can make a middle class wage without a college education. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be outsourced from overseas. You can't have someone in another country drive your truck in this country. And right now, those jobs are not automated. Mm -hmm. But I'm here to tell you there will be. And when they are automated, we're going to have a lot of people out of work all over the country. And so I'm finally going to answer your question. I'm known for my long, winding answer. <laughs> and I appreciate your patience. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you not leaving during this answer. <laughs> but I will say that we have a way to turn this around and move me back into the 23%. If we can think about education again as broader than the vocationally obsessed educational aspirations a lot of families, a lot of parents, and a lot of kids have right now, we're going to have several different careers over a lifetime as quickly as technology is changing, not just several jobs. And so in order to get ready for that wild, wild change that can give you whipsawed, we're going to have to go back to old time education. Albert Einstein had, um, who should have been on this panel instead of me, had a saying that 
arts, religions, and science are branches from the same tree. Mm -hmm. I think we need to go back to where we are failing, and that is being too narrowly cast in having vocationally oriented education, even if it's at a research university, and reintegrate the social sciences, the humanities, the arts with the STEM disciplines. Because we're going to need not only to have an understanding of phenomena, like why does a star look like that or why, what's dark matter, but we're going to have to understand society and people to know how to apply that knowledge. So I think we need to watch our tuition. We need to make sure that everybody has a way to get educated, and not just people going through the normal sequence, but those 1.8 million truck drivers. We're going to have to come together as a country and find ways to retrain them, re-educate them in different disciplines. And what keeps me up at night on not being melodramatic is how do we help those people put food on their table while they're being retrained? So that's what I'm concerned about. Okay. Well, I want to note that we tried to get Albert Einstein and he didn't return my calls. <laughs> <laughs> so let me turn back to you, Congressman. Sure. So what do you think um, about how we uh, close this gap between the folks who are starting to feel their jobs slip away and they don't see a way forward? Yeah, I, I think uh, a couple of things. One is is the opportunity where they can actually see the, a, a path out. And so many times uh, people that uh, end up in despair, uh, as was mentioned earlier, is because they don't see a way out. You know, they feel like, uh, well, I'm just, uh, this is the way it's going to be. And whether it was in Louisiana or anything else, they they just come to that point where they, uh, they can't see it. Now, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, my belief is uh, that those paths out uh, have to be opportunities and, and, and equal opportunities, but not necessarily that we put this person with this job and, and uh, you allow them to use their God-given abilities uh, that you uh, find that there are some people, I would hate to be a truck driver. I mean, uh, and, and yet at the same time, uh, I love numbers and I love, uh, I love to, to calculate and, and see that. And, and that would drive somebody else crazy. And so it, it's trying to find that. But the opportunity that we're talking about is, is really making sure uh, that we don't stand in the way of allowing great creativity. Uh, let's look at the, the nation of, of Israel in terms of startup companies, more startup companies per capita in that one uh, tiny little nation. And why is that? Where they're given the ability to fail. You know, we sometimes have this perfectionist mentality is don't fail at anything, and if you do, don't admit it. Uh, and yet, there they are applauded for their failures because it brings them that much closer to success. So uh, I, I think, you, one, you have an expectation that you can fail. And the other is, is when we're talking about opportunities, is that you listen to everyone. So you've got a very diverse panel. You put together a, a good group hoping uh, that, to get a good USA Today conflict. And, uh, <laughs> and so in, in doing that, though, uh, you know, my philosophy, my, my son was a national champion debater, and so he would argue both sides of, of the same resolution. So you had to be prepared to, to argue. But my philosophy is, is there's an element of truth in everything that is said. Now, the question for us is to find out how much of it is truth. You know, how much of what she is saying uh, do I perceive to be truthful? And then ultimately, how much of it is truthful? And so when you do that, that exploration of not having a box and finding out uh, the differences, it creates opportunities uh, that I think uh, many times... Uh, we, we sometimes miss in the bigger inner cities. We have you know, this program that's going to help with this group and this program that is going to help with that group. Instead of allowing, uh, allowing for the, that, that mind to explore the possibilities of, and creativity. So let me, let me uh, ask back. you a little, a little pushback in that USA Today fighting I would, spirit. I would be disappointed if you didn't. So... Uh, uh. so <laughs> While we're allowing that yeah. creativity yeah. to develop, you know, while we're allowing people to form their own opportunities, right. how do they put food on their table? How, how, do they, how do they survive day to day and find housing? Um, and what role should the government be playing in that? 
You know, uh, in, in terms of a helping hand, uh, really what happens is, as I see two different things that are happening. Uh, uh, the American people in general are very generous people, and even the government wants to provide that helping hand. At the same time, uh, there's an interesting phenomenon that's going on even in my district uh, where unemployment's at 4%. And, uh, and yet we had some of the highest unemployment in 2008 of anywhere in the country. I mean, I had two counties that were above 20%. And so, I mean, uh, and, and when, you, when you look at, at those numbers, they're staggering. However, uh, what, what I've found is, is that we have to also put a value back in work. Uh, and and what, what I'm seeing many times is, is that you have people that are going out and you say, well, uh, we have two standards. We have, we have probably uh, 2,000 jobs that could be filled today in my district, and there's two standards. You pass a drug test and show up to work. Now, those are pretty low bar, I mean, when you come to a work standard. And yet it gets back to what was said earlier. Um, if you provide that support, when they fall on hard times, and yet not so much so that it uh, becomes a trap, uh, so a safety net, uh, but a net can be used for two things. It can be to catch you, or it can be to contain you. And sometimes we have a difficulty in the containment part uh, that becomes uh, really, we say, well, this is the way it's going to be, and gets back to where I started with this, where, well, I'm, I, I get this, I can't break out of it. So we've got to, to balance those two. Mary Kay, I see you're champing at the bit there. You got something to say? Well, um, I don't think it's so individualistic. Um, I think that we have to take responsibility in a way that the cartoons showed us at the very beginning, that there are policy decisions and systems and structures that don't allow for individual creativity or initiative to flourish in a system where for the last 40 years, um, there's been this widening uh, inequality in our nation. And when you look around the globe, other countries are dealing with that inequality in very different ways. So I was just in a conversation with the Nordic countries about the social dialogue between government, business, uh, and civil society in Norway and Sweden. And they're dealing with inequality. And they make a different decision as a nation that child care ought to be universal so that women have equal access to the workforce and that elder care is a municipal function so that I can go to work and not worry about my mom falling because she has access to a middle class um, worker who can feed her family and not do what home care providers in the US do, which is work 100 hours a week and are in poverty, excluded from social security, um, ex used to be excluded from Fair Labor Standards Act, all because we've structured into the U.S. economy an exclusion of people who are never going to make it to the middle class. And for the people that have hel held middle class jobs have no hope of holding on to it because we don't have an economic policy that deals with the 1.8 million truck drivers. And the 1.8 million truck drivers, that's no longer a middle class standard of living. It was deregulated 40 years ago. There's 200,000 truck drivers left that have a middle class standard of living. The rest of them are living in poverty. Uh, and they're called independent contractors because the employment relationship has been severed. And so, you know, there's lot, th that's not going to be solved through an individual deciding to have more initiative, there's a structural problem that's keeping truck drivers from leading a middle class life in our nation. And it shouldn't just be truck drivers. Like home care providers and child care providers are care work in an economy that has never been valued in our nation. The Canadians value it. The Swedes value it. That is a really important job that our country needs as our population, as I age, as a 60-year-old. <laughs> Somebody's going to need to take care of me. And there's a million more of those jobs that are going to be needed in the next five years in the US. But they're poverty jobs. They aren't valued by us. And so when you think about what can be done, I just feel like it's a combination of working people being able to join together like we've been doing in supporting the fast food workers in their fight for 15 in a union. Imagine if the fast food companies did in the US what they've decided to do in other countries and allow those jobs to be middle class jobs in the US. 
It, 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 there's advertising that it's an entry-level job, but people are consigned to those jobs because they're structured in a way that doesn't allow them to do what Mark is saying. And I think there are individuals that sort of mir miraculously make it through, but it can't be that four million people are, want to do a minimum wage job that has no guaranteed hours and no benefits. That job should be financed by multinational corporations that decide to do that in Australia, Denmark, South Africa. Those jobs are 18 and $20 an hour jobs with a social security system where people have retirement and universal health care coverage and can actually provide for their families. So I just think it's more than individual choice. I think it's, as a nation, we have to make a decision that we aren't going to leave people behind. And I think what I have to do as a union leader is organize out of love. I think that the one uh, video where he ends by saying it's harder to organize out of love than hate, that's not my experience. I think most working people in this country would fight to the death for their kids. Mm -hmm. And my experience is that happens out of love for each other. And I think that we want to continue to mobilize and unite people to make a demand on our government for values that I believe Mark and I share. That's the, the craziness of this situation in the US, that Mark and I both believe that we want a, a country where our children can do better than we've done. That's, that's the promise of our nation. And that means that we have to decide as a nation that everybody's included. And we haven't done that. I see a bilat coming together right there. <laughs> Let me quickly ask Mike a question here. So the structures that Mary Kay is talking about, uh, would, if those kinds of things were in place, would it help you get the workforce that you absolutely would love to have? Would it help your workers? Uh, do you see it as something corporate America would buy into? I think the one uh, common thread that this pattern would, this panel would automatically agree on is the broken nature of the education system. Mm -hmm. If I was to think of one thing, I'm, I'm highly confident this group would agree on. And, and there are several elements to that that I want to focus on as part of the answer to your question. Because if we get this right, I, I'm not so sure Mary Kay will need to do all the organizing that she will have so much to do. I, I'd like to decline your workload by, <laughs> by creating that workforce in another way. And, and let me start with two things. Number one, and this is the one I feel most passionate about. I've worked on this for a long time. Early childhood education is profoundly important, profoundly underfunded, and if I could invest one dollar in one single thing, that would be it. Mm. It attacks intergenerational poverty, it provides new opportunities in populations that have had none, and it does it in a, an astonishing low price point with remarkable dividends over time. So I, I, if I would leave you with one thought, and when early child, when I say that phrase early childhood ed, we tend to get it wrong. We think of expanding uh, Head Start in the U.S. and that. Not, no, this is from minus nine months to three years old. Mm -hmm. The brain, every bit of science says that's when we win them or lose them. And once we lose them, we lock them in. And then the upward mobility statistics are atrocious. Right. The odds of a kid being broken by the time they're three and recovering are nil. Mm -hmm. Number two. Our current education system, this belief that we should still trundle off to school to be babysat by someone not very well paid and often not very well interested is a phenomenal decision of risk for our children. Is this really in a world, do we really think it modernizes the education system, that there's an iPad in the room? We, we have lost our minds. And, 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 think, and think about where the world is going, to David's point. It's such a great point. The real underlying anxiety, I believe, is nativist fear brought on by globalization and technology. And they believe those are going to wipe out all the jobs. I don't believe that. I believe we'll create whole new categories of work where empathy and a whole bunch of human skills that cannot be displaced will rise and be more important. But sure as heck, the changes are going to be really messy. And we better have a society that cares and helps people change. We better teach lifelong learning, which a classroom does not. We got to get these minds on a whole different path if they're going to be useful contributors in the future. And that will create the workforce I'm looking for. All right. All right, I like to see this kind of passion. Yeah, yeah. All, right. All right, David. 
Don't you just hate when you go to one of these panels and somebody says, you know, I agree with all the earlier points that were made. <laughs> well, damn it, I agree with all the earlier points that were made. But there's something missing from the panel, with respect to my co-panelists. It's what you had in the little clip in the beginning. It's the voice of the people affected. Now, I want to be presumptuous. The congressman goes back to his district. He probably gives this many speeches and this much listening. And when you go back to the union, you do this much speeches and this much listening. And so I think it's important that we find ways to bring the voice of people back into the conversation, because that's what, how, what America was really based on. In order to do that, I think we have to create, and it's terrible that we have to do this in a sort of an artificial way in 2018, we have to recreate sort of spaces where people feel comfortable disagreeing with each other and working their way through things, which is a great, great American tradition. Mm -hmm. Short commercial coming from museums, it'll be over soon. <laughs> if you look at a lot of the trust polls of what people trust, the military, museums, and libraries tend to flow a little higher in trust than many other institutions, members, types of it. Members of Congress are way up there. <laughs> oh yeah, well I mean, you right all there. are so high, you're, you're, you <laughs> can't even talk about it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Did I do okay, Mark? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. But I do, I do really, really believe that whether it's a museum or a library or whether we just decide to have dinners around our table and bring some people in who we don't usually agree with and just talk it around a little bit, people are going to feel a little bit more empowered. And I want to have one little minor disagreement. It's not really a strong disagreement, but part of the reason that many people feel that school teachers are not getting the job done, it's sort of a careful seesaw result uh, or chicken and the egg thing. Is it because the skills aren't there, because we're not paying them enough or giving benefits enough to attract the right kind of people, or because the education isn't right, or because the feedback isn't right? It's a complex calculus to figure that out. But I think we need to listen to the voice of the people, perhaps a little bit more than we do, and find some clever ways of doing that. Well, let me let Arlie take that question, because you have been spending a lot of time with the voice of the people. How would you suggest uh, that we go about connecting with these folks, that the people in power, the people who have the ability to access uh, Congress, the president, big money, jobs, connect? Uh, the uh, people I came to know um, uh, felt uh, very unheard and uh, unrecognized and uh, felt anxious that um, their deep story was, and they were anxious because they felt like they were waiting in line for the American dreams, kind of like, this is a deep story, they're like a pilgrimage. And their, their feet were faced forward, they were hard working, they'd played by the rules, uh, and their feet hadn't moved. 20 years hadn't got a raise. And in the right wing deep story, people seemed at the second moment be cutting in line. Who was that? Well, it would be blacks who through federally mandated affirmative action uh, are finally given access to jobs reserved for whites. Even worse, women uh, through federally mandated affirmative action, in their view, uh, were finally given jobs uh, formerly reserved for men, and then refugees, and uh, illegal immigrants, even animals. They thought, well, these environmentalists are putting animals over people. So it's waddling ahead and cutting in line. So it felt unfair to them. And they blamed Obama. They were really very alarmed by him, because he seemed to be a, a a line cutter too, waving to the line cutters. And oh, the federal government isn't doing for me, it's forgotten me, and I'm going backwards. And, and the fear of that, the feel of feeling, of feeling estranged from the government and, and pushed back culturally, not their culture anymore. They felt seen as, as uh, racist and homophobic and uh, sexist and Fat, <laughs> that's how they <laughs> felt that liberals saw them, and um, ill-educated and so on. So they were insulted, and how you now connect them, I'm now part of a movement that's, uh, I, it's, you won't hear about newspaper. I hope you hear about it in uh, USA Today um, eventually, but it's called the Bridge Alliance. There is a... Um, umbrella group, some 80 different civic, 
kind of grassroots organizations with funny names like Hi from the Other Side or Living Room <laughs> Conversation, and it's actually started by moderate uh, Republican and Democrat. And I've, uh, some of my Louisiana people have been up to visit me in Berkeley, and we've done a number of these living room conversations left and right together. And you, in a way, help restore what's natural and what both sides really want. Um, and uh, so I, I, I see something happening. I, I have to say that I don't think we're getting national leadership from the top in, in this, but there is nonetheless a people-to-people -people movement. And um, I have a vision of what, if you want that, of what we really need. What, if you can make it brief, because mm, I didn't leave enough time for questions from the audience. Okay, so okay. We'll give you a one minute sum up. Okay, unions used to pull people from different sectors of society, different classes and regions, and rural, urban, black, white together. And uh, the military used to pull us together, you know, compulsory military for men, or you know, public schools when everybody went to them. Uh, pull people together. Now we need to make it up, and I'd like to see a high school program for high school seniors uh, spend a month outside their region in class. So you get coast to go inland, and inland to go coast. You get south to go north, you get north to go south for a month of, uh, and you train students ahead uh, in active listening and in uh, the importance of civic engagement. So you prep them for it, you, and then they work together on building homes for the homeless or uh, installing uh, solar panels, something. I think we need to make that up, and I'd love Congress to actually um, fund it. OK, well, we, we have very little time left, so I'm going to ask if anyone here has any questions, but I would ask that you make your question brief. Yes. My name is Anjara Jackson. I'm from the United States. Uh, I'm a physician there. Uh, I do appreciate all of your comments. I think it's been some great insight. But I think a number of you touched upon bringing different people together. I have to say, when the panel walked up, I was extremely struck by the fact that there's not one person of color on that panel. How can you begin a dialogue talking about addressing the needs of people who are left behind when they are not included? I'm very disappointed about that. It's, it's more of a comment than a question. OK, no other questions? All right, well, then we'll go back to the panel. So who would like to weigh in with a, oh, there, there are questions. Oh, sorry. Thank you. This is a question perhaps to the congressman, perhaps to someone else. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm hearing is that a large number of folks who feel left behind, who've voted for this administration, resent labels, that other people are using labels and they don't like that. But I've heard you talk about those people living in the cities. And I think that labels have been used by everybody. And so I'm not sure if you'd like to address that or not. Sure, I'll be glad to. I, I think uh, really demographically, I think, is what I, I was referring to because you, you can have Tea Party members in the middle of, of Washington, D.C., uh, both of them. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 you know, uh, so, you, so your point is, is well taken. I, I think the real, the real interesting dynamic is, is that you see this uh, left behind side of things with people of color, uh, uh, people in rural uh, areas that, that many times feel like that they're just not being pulled into uh, that American dream. And, and, uh, and you're right, there's people who feel like they're getting in line, uh, that somebody is getting in line in front of them. Uh, but I, I also think you know, you've got a very uh, uh, relatively diverse, excluding uh, uh, the well-taken uh, point, uh, uh, you know, from an ideological point of view right here in, in the way that maybe we see the world. So, so the critical thing is to have dialogue without making a certain assumption. Uh, the, the very th fact that I talk a little slower than most people from uh, New York, 
uh, automatically conjures up the fact that they think I, I think as slow as I talk. You know, and but we, we have these bias that, that automatically get uh, hit with uh, all of us. And I think uh, one of the interesting things in Congress um, is that I probably have just as many very dear Democrat friends uh, that can't be public with that because if they uh, they are public with it, uh, all of a sudden they're seen on the House floor with a camera picture of you know the vast right wing conspiracy being right there beside uh, you know someone who's progressive, and, and we've got to do away with that. Uh, I, I can tell you, for me, in in my office, we have we've gone out and I said I want you to find every Democrat piece of legislation that I could possibly co-sponsor uh, and to try to start to break that down. Uh, some of my dear friends, uh, Elijah Cummings is, is an African-American uh, congressman from Maryland. Dear friend, I would do anything for him. In fact, he has a piece of legislation was signed into law under this president uh, that I co-sponsored. Uh, he was the lead person. Uh, and, and when we look at that, we're we're combining on different things like prescription drug prices and why they should be so high because that doesn't just affect his district, which is Baltimore, an urban area. It affects mine, which is a, a rural area, uh, you know, where it's, uh, you know, the, a, a big city is 900 people. And so uh, we've got to find ways to do that. But so many times we put this special label on uh, and it's our way of describing uh, who they may or may not be. And, um, and you have a certain perception. I mean, you, you've Googled, y'all have done your Google research on all of us up here. And so you have a certain perception of what we're going to be like. And what I love to do is go into a conversation with somebody and just blow their mind and say, well, you know, uh, you know I'm, I'm for this or I'm for that. Uh, and so if we can do that, uh, regardless of where somebody lives, and it gets back to the point you were making. We want everybody to have an opportunity, regardless of who they are, what color they are, what race they are, where they live, and yet many of them, the reason why we think that they're not going to, our kids are not going to have it is because it's, it's for the well-connected or it's for the person that might have to be uh, in this particular location. Uh, I still believe in an America that says that that type of opportunity is there, uh, and yet I find when I walk a mile in their moccasin, I have a very different perspective, so we need to do more of that. So speaking of legislation, and this panel seemed to be uh, a lot in agreement on uh, education, what do you think about Mike's idea of early childhood education, zero to three, would that be something you would bring to your colleagues in Congress on both sides of the aisle? Yeah, the, the real question, and, and certainly, you know, he's right from a uh, physiological standpoint. I mean, we know the brain development is there, and yet what we, we've got to make sure of is that those types of things actually produce a result. And, uh, and so as we look at that, providing that opportunity uh, there, when we look at government being the answer, uh, I've, I've been involved with that enough to see where they really make huge mistakes. And yet, uh, I probably have been in more schools in my district than any other uh, candidate uh, you know, in the last uh, two decades. So, so looking at how do we do best do that and how do we best fund that is, is certainly uh, something that, honestly, Ivanka Trump has been bringing up a number of times and trying to soften that. Okay. All right. I think we have time for one last question. Is there anything from the audience? Okay. Somebody over here? Um, yeah, I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, I, I feel like we're missing um, a lot of the questions that we asked earlier. Like, um, you know, the original point, right, which is we're going to talk about trickle-down economics and whether or not it works and doesn't. And we've had a lot of really robust conversation around the gutted social contract, right, that we feel that, that we're unbelievably missing in the U.S. And, and in some ways, and I don't want to point at you, Congressman, but I feel like you're creating a, an opportunity for us to do so. I do that quite <laughs> often, but go ahead. And I don't, it's not a, a bias or perception yeah. or anything. It, it's a question as to what, what would you just articulate as fundamental to the social contract of the United States? Because it doesn't feel like in a, in a party sense 
that we're getting it in healthcare or investment in education or the fundamental things that actually support workers um, and regulation around making the world safe and grow. And so I just want to hear your yeah. response. Okay, so this is going to be the rapid round. Okay. So you got 30 seconds. Rapid round. Government normally does not provide equality. It provides inequality. And that goes, that will be like nails on a chalkboard to many of you. But generally speaking, if government is the one who's deciding the winners and losers, it typically will, will enter into a contract that is not fair or equal. Mary Kay, respond, 30 seconds. I, I just think that we are in a, a global forum where we're trying to encourage social dialogue between many um, different parts of civil society, uh, employers, academics, um, elected officials. And if government is not a lever for equality in this world, I don't know what is. Um, and so, especially in the United States, where the people speak through how we participate in our democracy, um, I think we have to, while we share values, we clearly have a very different um, of opinion of how we get things done. And uh, I do think it requires a new social contract where we reach agreement on the basic things that we as taxpayers want to have for everyone in our nation, and that we want everyone included. We want every immigrant on a path to citizenship. We want re every returning citizen from prison to be able to also exercise their vote. We want to enfranchise our people to participate in our democracy. And I think it happens by expanding the ability of unions, because people can have disagreements when they trust each other and can speak across difference. OK, well, that is it for us. Please give a warm round of thanks to our panelists. Thank you all for joining us today.